Hello everyone, welcome to the five, three, one. That's five questions, three compliments and one stroll. And my guest this week is former footballer Martin Gritton. Hi Martin. Hi Dan. Hello. Uh, Gritton, I've known him for quite a long time. I met him through uh, Robbie Knox and we've done a podcast together. We've done many podcasts together, but uh, the main one is Football Legends, which is on Spotify, which we do also with Robbie Knox yep. and my co- uh, co-author of my football books, uh, John Smith. So thanks very much for doing this, Brits. For those that don't know, um, tell us a bit about your, who, who did you play for in your career? So you played uh, mainly League One and League Two, didn't you? Who, who did you play for? Yeah, so uh, many teams up and down the country, but um, uh, played for 13 years professionally, started at Plymouth, did a wee loan to Yeovil, went to Torquay, then moved to the country to Grimsby, moved to Lincoln, had a little Mansfield spell, Went to Macclesfield, Chess. Only got about 15 minutes. This yeah, week. we'll probably just, yeah, what? play for a lot of clubs in England too. Okay, great, thanks. It's the Fab 3 1 interviews. It's the Fab 3 1 interviews. It's the Fab 3 1 interviews. It's the Fab 3 1 now. My first question is um, I don't know if you know this, but um, Charlie Nicholas once had a trial for Ipswich Town wow. when Bobby Robson was there. And they wanted to sign him, and uh, he turned them down because he was a Celtic boy, okay. and Ipswich played in blue like Rangers. Wow! And he didn't think that he could play for a team in blue. So my question is: Have you ever turned down a club or not played for a club for some strange reason? Also, you of course being a Celtic boy yourself. Uh, do you know what? One of the one of the hardest things I ever did. I'd never turned a club down. But I played, it was very difficult for me a couple of times. I remember one of my first memories as a footballer, was, well, not as a footballer, as just a kid even, was playing in the Cub Scout Jamboree, five or six, and it's like the UK wide Jamboree, and it was in Newquay. And we basically cobbled together a team out of our little district, and we had a really good little team, and we got to the final list. It was like hundreds of games, I just remember thousands of kids. It was like a refugee camp of Cub Scouts. Uh, in, in this caravan park and we got to the final and for the final the, the guy was like oh a special treat you're going to be wearing the England kit in the final it was like a red England kit must have been like an admiral one and I was like I can't wear that I mean you must have been seven and still <laughs> I can't wear that I'm not wearing that kit and then when I played for England I got in the England University team which was a really proud moment for me and my dad came to watch and I scored against Scotland and <laughs> he did not that did not go down well that did not go down well. I think we beat Scotland one there. Let's go to header, and um, and didn't really feel like celebrating after that. So yeah. I don't think that would have gone down too well with the family. Luckily, uh, luckily my extended family don't keep an eye on England University scores for the British Uni games. But um, but yeah, it was a proud moment in a way. But yeah, wearing that England kit is I've got like a checkered pass with it. And so yeah, let's let's leave that one now. <laughs> so it's compliment time now, Brits. So I watched uh, quite a lot of your goals um, last night. And uh, some lovely finishes in there. I'm a big fan of how you finish when you're when you're playing up front. There's, you know, they're just lovely sort of passes into the corner. You know, giving the keeper the eyes. My favourite finish of yours. You're playing for Torquay, and I think uh, Joe Kufour plays a ball through to you, and a nice little chest yeah. take in front. Keeper comes out, and you could probably lob him then, mm. but. You don't, you just do a little cheeky chip over him, run round him and then tap it in, a bit like Waddle did for uh, yeah. Marseille once. A uh, fantastic goal, that. That's my, my right. you remember that one? Thank you very much. That I, count as a question. Do you know one of, the, yeah. one of the best things about that game was I signed for Torquay, I uh, signed for Stockport. It was against Stockport, we beat them 2-0, it was in League One and I scored them both. So I come off that pitch, it was one of those weird ones where I'd, one of my best mates from Manchester, he'd come to watch and then of course we've beaten two now. Stockport probably looked at us like we, we, they should batter us and probably should have done that. They, they had a lot of good players playing that day. But um, I got subbed off at about 85 minutes in. I got a clap off the home fans. Did this and then let it go to my head like an idiot. It turned around and gave, and they, like, they gave me a bit, of, bit back. But the stick I got off my own teammates, they were like, who do you think you are? Ronaldo, this isn't, this isn't Old Trafford. You know, you haven't just scored at saying the Champions League, you slapped one in with your right foot, and the first one that you dinked over the keeper, we're not sure if you meant it. 
um, what is your favourite or best or weirdest bit of memorabilia from your career? And can we can we have a look at it? Okay. Bit, bit here. Well, you're in luck. I just I just reclaimed it from my brother's basement the other day uh, when I was playing footy. This would have been Manchester, so it might have been Michael Suit. Um, I obviously, from my days at Torquay, was still good mates with Helen Chamberlain, who was presenting Soccer M at the time. She also presented the darts, loved going for the darts. So you would go up to the Winter Gardens in Blackpool and watch the world, and it's just, it's a different one. The experience is sensational, brilliant. Like the characters involved, you know, it would be funny, you'd watch them all. Since the modern smoking rules, like, you'd have to go outside for a fag, so the whole of the hall would go out. So the whole of the winter gardens would be out having a tab on the street. But the best thing was the darts players would be out there with them. Yeah. So you'd have like rolling shoulders like out there if you're bumming a light off someone or yeah. you'd have like kind of fill the power out there. The best thing was because Helen was working for Sky at the time, she was like going, oh, I'll get you something. So uh, let me go and get it. Okay. Okay, so as you can probably see here, this, uh, this was liberated from... We were there for the semi-finals and Helen just wow. went up and she just pulled the, the board that they used wow. in the World Championships. So it's a little bit, needs a little bit of TLC, but you can see you've got Sid Waddell, uh, the, the late great, the late great Sid Waddell. I interviewed him up in Blackpool once, yeah. Yeah, we've got Phil the Power, we've got John Park, we've got Colin Lloyd, who was the World Champion and called Sharky, that's uh, the shark there drawing on the back. Amazing. So I got this and, and there was something about the fact she just went and ripped it off the... And that's off. the actual one they used. That's the actual one they used. So yeah, we'll probably still get a few holes from there. Uh, so they use a different board for each semi-final. So yeah, that's a real cracker. So I've, I, I liberated it because I'd like to put it in a, in a wee cabinet. But um, yeah. I've got a few shirts over the years, but uh, that in terms of a, a fun bit of kit, it's slightly different. That is nice. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So Griggs, you played under a lot of managers. You played many seasons of mm -hmm. football, lots of different characters. Yeah. What is the best rant by a manager that you saw in your career, or most memorable rant? Oh, well, I've been on the receiving end of a few uh, quite severe ones. Um, one manager, um, and I'm not going to name his name, but it was during a particularly, it was early on in my career, and it was during a particularly tough time for him. I think he was just going through some kind of just dealing with things in a, in a way where we went and played away a long way away from home and I think we we kind of got beat last minute or something anyway as he's delivering this you know this rant he is taking off a bit of clothing at a time so, ah, but he's going on and on and on he's getting to the point where you're like is he just going to stop and carry on giving us this or is he just going to keep going and he's stripped down until he's like naked <laughs> And he's then just standing there and he's got his boots and his socks on and he's standing and I'm like going, I don't think he, he hasn't got a picture of this or anything good at how this works. And he, he ran to one of the lads, he's going, you know, you're not getting tight enough. And he ran, but he's on like a wet dressing room. He just slid towards him, boots, completely in the buff. And then it was at that moment when he kind of got to the end of it and he just stood there looking like, like this teen wolf sort of pose, but completely naked and that he kind of lost his edge and became slightly more comical. So at that point, we were just like, should we just, should we just all get back on the bus and get home and you can carry this on probably all week? Because <laughs> uh, we weren't playing particularly well at the time. That was, a, that was one that stuck in the memory. The same guy did one and he started to remove his clothes, boots first this time, so he thought that'd be better. But he's chucked his foot down, and the boots hit the teapot. The teapot, the hot tea's going over some of our players. And one of the players was a very big odd lad, and he just picked up. So the thing that the teapot was on was like one of these boot skips, which was a silver one, and he was just throwing the boot skip, and then the hot tea's gone all down, and it just like, it was like a Burt Reynolds film, it was like Cannonball Run or something, everyone's just chucking stuff, and I'm like, it seems a bit excessive. It all came from him stripping off again, yeah. so if he'd just not taken his clothes off and just stuck to ranting, it might have been more effective. Time for a compliment, Chris. I've, I've um, known you a few years now, I think. I'm, we met through a mutual friend. Um, he's got a YouTube channel, some people know him. Robbie Knox. How about it? Um, and uh, this, this is my compliment. It's a slightly complicated one. A few years ago, uh, Robbie Knox made 
quite quite an insulting video about me um, for for an event that we both attended yeah. um, with with the, with the coercion of my wife, um, betrayal of my wife, I might even say, and it was shown to a group of our, our peers, and um, I, I was I was I was roundly laughed at for this video, <laughs> and. Uh, um, and everyone laughed, and then we moved on, and we, we enjoyed the rest of the day. And, and grits, and you're, you're someone who's hardened by, I would have thought, by dressing room banter. And I've heard a lot of the stories that you had um, yeah. uh, in the dressing room over the years. Pr pretty harsh stuff. So you, you're quite hardened, and yet you were the, you were the only person that came up to me after you went. Was that, was that all all right, mate? You, you were right about all that. <laughs> <laughs> the only one. Everyone else just went. Ah, that is that is brilliant. The only one I thought that was a really nice set. I was absolutely. It was absolutely fine, I'm only joking, it was absolutely fine. But I thought, what a nice thing to do. I'm glad you remember yeah. that, mate. I'm glad you remember that. I, I, yeah, but some people, that's it, when they're not, when they're not forged in the fiery furnaces of yeah. dressing room banter, <laughs> they can be quite uh, un, uh, unkind about it. So, uh, no, I think you took it very well. Yeah. And in the spirit of it, but, but thanks, no. Yeah. I'm, all, I'm always there for you, Dan. Thanks, mate. So, me and John Smith wrote, uh, we've written two books now about footballers' autobiographies and in, in the first one we talked a lot about nicknames and the rules of nicknames for footballers. And when, uh, so it's, just, you know, it's the shortening of the surname and then whether it should be an S on the end or a Y or an O and the reasons why those things might change. So, you know, David Beckham was, was nicknamed Bex because if it had been a Y, it would have been Becky. Yes. So you can't do it if it's a girl's name. So, so then it's, then it's, so it's Bex. I got you. Okay. Now you've always been known as grit, not gritty. Yeah. Because that's the other rule. If, it, if it's another word, another sort of normal word, then that's that's generally not used. So you've always been grit, not gritty. But did you ever have any other nicknames as a player? I think when I started out, when I was at Plymouth, I got loaned out to Shelburne in the uh, in the Irish League in Dublin. What happened was I turned up uh, in like a real, basically my old student coat. It was like it was pouring rain. It was the winter when I signed that. And I, I did look a little bit scruffy. And one of them went, you selling the big issue? And I was like, oh. and they went, big issue? We'll call them big issue. And that's, they called me big issue for about four months. I thought it was hilarious. I mean, like no disrespect, because obviously it's, 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 not a, it's not a nice subject. Yeah. To, but in terms of dressing room banter, they thought this is great. And yeah. um, the worst thing was Jim Gannon, who's the centre half at the time, he's now the manager of Stockport. So he came in at the end of his career. So not only did I, I have to suffer the indignity of not scoring while I was at Stockport, he came back in and re, like reignited big issues. So he went, oh, big issue. And everyone turned and looked and went, what did he just call you? And I was like, we're not starting that again. Okay, so final compliment, Grits. Um, I've known you for a few years now, and uh, you're uh, you're very kind because because you play football, and I've, I have a massive football obsession. You know, uh, you never seem too bothered when I'm constantly asking you stories about what it was like being a footballer. <laughs> so it's really nice that you don't mind asking uh, me asking you all those things, and you do have a fund of incredible anecdotes. Um, so. It sort of ties into my last question. Okay. So, as usual, I'm asking you for an anecdote again. Uh, and this one is, what is the strangest or weirdest thing that you saw happen in a dressing room, either before or during or after a game? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, it's probably a story I've told before, but I played with some characters. I mean, Grimsby was such a fun, funny we had a great, great time, so we had a good dressing room, but also, you know, we had a bit of success, we did well in a couple of the cups, and beat Spurs in the Carling Cup, and etc. Anyway, I played up front of this absolute madcap Irishman called Michael Reddy, and he... Um, yeah, he played for some... Yeah, yeah, great striker. And he just, like, he'd just be on a wind-up before the game, he'd never be taking anything seriously, but he'd always do it out in the pits, he'd always be like, he's our best player by a mile. Um, but there was this, it was the season that refs, had to come in and tell you about whether they were going to use one ball for the match or you could have balls all around the pitch. But anyway, Reds had got into his head that it was funny that every time the ref came in that he would just start by like, like banging a panel going Whoa, like that. And the ref would be coming down the tunnel, you could see him coming down to you like, oh, and the ref would come in and go, it's multi-ball today, multi-ball, yeah! And you just like go off and he'd be like sliding on his knees and he'd be like, oh, come on! about something that was completely inconsequential. The only time it might matter whether it was multi-ball or not, um, it'd be like kind of, if you were playing a team that were like, you know, away from home or whatever, but certainly not at home. 
and uh, <laughs> he just come and you just feel like mad Irish and running around like a just insane Labrador before a game. It was always good distraction. I mean, sometimes some of the most serious players would 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 let it get to them, but but you've always got to have a Michael ready in your dressing room. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> um, okay, so that that is the end. Now we've done our done our questions and compliments. Um, as, as I said before, the five, three, one, uh, the one is the stroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not yeah, that have to be careful. yeah. Have to be careful. Sorry. Um, so we, we've been sitting in your living room, which is very yeah. nice. Um, so do you mind if we go up for a stroll, or are you, are you busy, or? Let's do it. Yeah. Have a look. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. We'll, we'll just do that quick because yeah. otherwise it doesn't fit the format. So. If that's the format, Dan, then we must honour it. Awesome. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, so this is the, the stroll, yes. Fritz. Um, normally I might ask you a question here, but I've, I've used up my five allotted questions. All right. So it will be against the format. I can't, I can't actually ask you anything else now. Okay. Um, but uh, it's been been really good. I've really, really enjoyed it. I had a great time. It's, it's been lovely chatting to you, Dan. So we can, we can go for a nice long stroll, if you like. Uh, I mean, I I'm good. Yeah, you alright? Yeah, yeah, listen, listen, you finish it off for me. I'll, um, I'll catch up soon. Yeah, okay. Alright then, well, thanks, mate. Alright, bye. I'll see you next week.